Wow. People are impressed. Really, people never quiet down like that just when the speaker sits down. So welcome, everyone, uh, to our Bob and Elizabeth Dole series on leadership. Several months ago, Senator Dole, who was one of our founders, turned 95. And we were, um, well, we always send him chocolate milkshakes. That's kind of his thing. <laughs> but we were trying to think about something that might be a little more lasting than a milkshake. And um, when we thought about what Senator Dole had brought to the country, um, this basic kind of core idea of leadership, which um, is this kind of intangible notion that everybody's always calling for, felt to us like one of his real accomplishments. And our aspiration with this series is to bring together leaders, um, some from government, but um, really more focus of you know, private sector, educators, you know, advocates, uh, community leaders, people who are overcoming real challenges and trying to figure out you know, what are the characteristics and circumstances that allow some people to succeed. You know, our view of Congress in a very simplistic way is that they're basically pretty good people with pretty bad incentives. <laughs> and trying to figure out how other people have you know, navigated those incentives. Because we all, you know, if leadership were easy, we'd all be doing it. Um, and so that's really the question for today. You know, what enables some people to unite others, overcome obstacles, and kind of deal with the aggression that is necessary in a free democratic society. We led off with a couple of really great political thinkers, George Mitchell, one of our founders, David Gergen. We've had a couple of CEOs, uh, Lola Gads with Verizon, and really tremendous opportunity today with Vicki Holub um, to try to think about what um, her life might uh, bring to bear. And obviously, Washington could use a little help, so we appreciate the morning. Um, Vicki began working at uh, Occidental in 1982. She was appointed president of the company and CEO in 2016. In the intervening time, um, Vicki spent quality time in, in Russia, Venezuela, Ecuador, and then I think the most challenging exotic political system of all, California. <laughs> yeah. And so really, we kind of want to just spend a little time now talking about how you have engaged through your career in an industry that has been through incredible technological swings, by definition, remarkable economic swings, and then also a uh, cultural challenge. I think the way the oil industry is viewed in this country um, obviously brings opportunity and pressure to bear on the uh, industry. So with that kind of introduction, I'm going to ask questions for 20 minutes or so. Um, maybe 27, and then open it up to the audience. So if you all can think about what you might want to ask Vicki, I want to kind of split the conversation up into a little bit of just a discussion about you, because you're cool and interesting, and then a little bit about maybe, you know, the career in the company, and then we'll spend some time talking about climate change and just the energy business in general. Vicki grew up uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, and I guess what I want to know first is, as a little girl, did you, did you dream of one day becoming a mineral engineer? I know, that was not a part of my dreams. Uh, I grew up, though, being a, um, an incredible Alabama football fan. My parents just thought Bear Bryant was, uh, was God. And, and we, in Alabama, I've told some of you that there wasn't a lot to do in Alabama, so you really had to have something to latch on to, and uh, that was football. 75% of the state are those that are enlightened and follow Alabama. There's the 25% that follow Auburn. <laughs> Not yet informed. And so um, I grew up a huge football fan. So I grew up, the, the, first, the first hint of starting to figure out and think about what my future should be was uh, I wanted to, to do something around football and, and talk shows and statistics and reporting on football was something I thought about early on in my life and you know there were only men doing that at the time um, but then I was the first person from my high school to make all-state band playing French horn so I thought I was really good at that and I'd put so much time into it I had to work harder than anybody else to to play and uh, and I was always battling my my best friend to be first chair trumpet so our band director saw that battle continuing and getting almost a little bit edgy so he asked, he said, which one of you wants to switch to French horn because we have nobody playing French horn? So I switched and, and uh, thought I was good at that. I got to Alabama and realized that uh, 
I had a great instructor, private instructor for French horn, who ultimately asked me the, the right question is, what do you aspire to be? And I said, I want to be playing the Boston Symphony or the Philadelphia Philharmonic. I, I want to always play and not teach. And he said, well, then we need to talk. <laughs> uh, that was a bad weekend for me. I went home. Uh, I expected my parents to console me, and they said, good, let's go out and have a dinner and celebrate. And uh, <laughs> we, around my house, there was a lot of coal mining, so I thought I'll go into coal mining. And went down first time into a Jim Walter mine. It was cold. It was wet. It was um, a little, you know, dim, and uh, I thought, if I'm going to have to, as a coal mining engineer, go down into these mines, I just can't do it. I can't do it again. So then I, our next trip was out to a drilling rig, drilling in um, a well near Tuscaloosa. And uh, it was so exciting that I thought, this is it. This is what I, I have to go into. And it's, it's incredible that, that a whole career can be determined off of just futile things like that. But I got into the industry. I love the industry. It's, uh, it's been so much fun. And part of it is because it gave me the opportunity to go and do a lot of different things, to go to Russia just after the fall of the Soviet Union and to see that country as it started to, to try to change. And then to go to Venezuela and um, have to be escorted by the military because we were working on wells that were close to Colombia. And the FARC was very active in Colombia, so we had a military escort. Now the situation sort of reversed there. But, but then to go to Ecuador, which was um, almost my dream job, because I was, I was given the opportunity to, to work out in the, in the jungles, running our jungle operation. We, uh, and we, it was self-sustaining. There were no cities there to provide us power um, or water service or anything. So we had to build our own little place to, to provide everything. And I had the opportunity to manage um, about 100 Ecuadorian employees and, and quite a few contractors, uh, several hundred contractors. And that gave me the chance to, to realize that, that you know, if you're in the right culture, you, you can survive. And what helped me there was the Ecuadorian people, their demeanor and their, their personalities and culture was so accepting of me and so supportive. And, and it made that work. But that was, that was my first fun, extreme environment that uh, that helped to, to mold me and, and help me in this industry. I love the fact that your first response was about football, something kind of formative in your life that allowed you to imagine the world differently. If people ask me why I started the Bipartisan Policy Center, I usually, because I was a middle child. Right? I mean, I think that actually at a very, very <laughs> fundamental basis, um, I was pre-designed. Um, I got to ask you then about D.J. Durkin. Like, what the heck? You know, I mean, D.C. <laughs> is exporting a lot of great things to the world, but um, the Maryland coach just does not seem like the thing Alabama, as it goes towards the playoffs, should be. Uh, We're very upset about that. <laughs> but we hope it'll coach us through the playoffs. Uh, he's going to be incredible. We'll come back to that. All right, so um, your first job was apparently on a you know, rig in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. The oil industry um, now is about... 20% women. My guess is that you, that rig was probably similarly a rather male-dominated environment. You were young. Was that tough? Well, it, what helped me, though, is I, I think where whatever job you're in, if it, whether you're in a job working with different cultures or you're in a job working um, with all women or all men, um, it's always important to have some way to connect. and. My, my childhood gave me that connection mm -hmm. to be able to talk about football to those guys. I worked a lot in Louisiana, too, so Mississippi, Louisiana. Um, the icebreaker for me always did, was to talk about football and to not be too offensive about Ole Miss or LSU, mm -hmm. but, but to just talk about it. And so that was the icebreaker. That's how people, they, they sort of accepted me. When, when I first pulled up on location, they're thinking, why is she here? But then when we started talking about football in the South, that is the connector. And, and that really helped to break the ice and to help me get to know them. They, they taught me some lessons, too, though, because um, what, I, what, what I tried to do is never work rigs on Saturdays during fall. But what I found out, though, is that the other thing that I had to pay a lot of attention to was the opening of deer season. 
And I once was, was about to, to make them run rigs on the opening of deer season and realized I don't have that much power. <laughs> so, so I adjusted to that. But it's, it's really making the connection in some way. Something that your staff has told me about you is that you take a lot of time and real pride in being a mentor. Um, in your years in the company, are there people who you found kind of gave you advice or you know, pointed you towards opportunities that you might not otherwise have thought about? Yeah, in, in Oxy, Oxy was from way back, early on, the Dr. Hammer days, was a, was a company that was pretty accepting of diversity and promoted diversity. And I did have some good leadership throughout my entire career. But the, the real thing that, that changed the, I think, trajectory of my career was when one of our, um, our managers, uh, Glenn Van Golan, within our company, gave me the opportunity to take that position in Ecuador. Uh, I was the first field manager in, um, of any of our locations, especially to be given that role in one of our international assignments out in the middle of the jungle. When, when I first showed up, I was the only female there. Um, that, he took a chance to do that. And he had to, even though we were generally open to diversity, he did have some opposition to that. And he had to stand up to the opposition and say, she is going to do that job. She's going to do it well. Did, did you so, learn about soccer? How did you handle the Ecuadorans? <laughs> I learned, uh, yeah, the, yeah, football is, is they, they don't like the word soccer, yeah. first of all. And football is critically important. Uh, we, we built a soccer field for them. And uh, we made sure that we, we did all those things to help them. But, but the one thing that that, that that made me do is work harder. Because if somebody trusts in you and they give you a job, and you know they've had to work to get you that job, you're going to work, you're going to do absolutely everything you can to be successful, not only for yourself, but for them because they had the faith in you. And that was the first person that gave me my chance. The, the second big chance that was given to me was by our former CEO, Steve Chazen, who, who um, endorsed me to, to get this role and mentored me to, to help me be, um, get into the role and, and know a little bit about what I was doing initially. So I want to talk a little bit about your time as CEO, um, and how people kind of think about your role as CEO. So the um, small magazine Forbes did a profile and wrote, as the first woman to run a big American oil company, Vicki Holub has quickly made Occidental Petroleum leaner, smarter, and gentler, and poised to gush her cash for the next half century. What's this gentler thing, right? Like, so, you know, as you and I were talking a little bit, <laughs> I think of you as an incredibly successful, courageous, powerful CEO who happens to be a woman. And a lot of people seem to approach you as a remarkably interesting woman who happens to be a CEO. And the, I mean, it's a big deal, right? You are, as you just described, you have broken through a lot of obstacles. But how do you want to think about your role as a woman leading a major corporation? And have you made it gentler? I believe I've made it more thoughtful. And part of the, the gentler thing comment comes from the fact that during the downturn, unlike uh, many companies in the oil and gas industry, we did not have massive layoffs. Because during the downturn, we decided that two things needed to happen. We needed to first honor our value proposition to our shareholders. And in honoring that value proposition, we did not cut our dividend. And that was hard. It was hard to make it without cutting our dividend, but we, we worked worked uh, tirelessly to, to make sure that we could accomplish that. And secondly, was to not lay off our employees. Our employees had always been loyal to us. We wanted to be loyal to them. And so what we thought about, and, and this was with the help of our leadership team, uh, we came up with the concept that we would, instead of laying employees off, we would have a group of employees. Our activity level was lowered. So instead of having employees sitting around doing nothing, we put them over in special groups to look at how do we address the future? How do we address our sustainability? What are the things that we need to do to lower our cost in the future? And the other thing we did is we sent some of our early career employees to the field to replace some of our contractors and to help support those areas that, that where we thought there were opportunities. Um, those employees, we thought it was going to be a learning experience for them, but they got out to the field our, our field people, our more experienced older field people, took them in and uh, helped them. And it turned out that they actually improved the efficiency of our operations. It was more than a learning experience. They asked the right questions. They were, 
they were smart enough to do it in a, in a way that was not offensive to our very experienced people in the field and it became a great experience for our company and now we do it routinely now it's a part of our process to send early career people out there I think that's awesome. You know, when we um, have ambitious career people who want to see the roughneck side of the world, we ask them to go to Congress. And so it's a similar <laughs> kind of cycle. Um, so you have a lot of ideas about how to you know, lead your company. I think the choice to really invest in human capital um, obviously must have had a significance. But when you think about your leadership, you know, where else would you um, point to in terms of how you have engaged or changed the arc of the company um, since you've taken over? I think that the other way we've been able to change is that we, we have throughout our organization, we've gotten the right people in the right positions, and we've been empowered and engaged our employees to, uh, to take more ownership of our decisions and to drive our success. And you know, not letting employees off, uh, I, we got some pressure. Our leadership team got some pressure about that because others were doing it. Uh, we got a little bit of pressure from the investment community and others who were concerned that we just weren't focused enough on lowering cost. So what, what our employees have been able to do during this downturn is because we've made focus on engaging and empowering them and getting the right people in the right positions, they've actually exceeded our expectations. And we had set a goal that even though we went through a portfolio optimization process where we divested of 40% of our assets that weren't meeting our return targets, we were able to grow our cash flow back from that and meet a target that we had promised our investors of um, cash flow increase. We met that target six months ahead of our schedule. First of all, the investment com community didn't think we'd be able to do it at all. And secondly, they were shocked that we were six months ahead of schedule. We were six months ahead of schedule because the, the employees stepped up and went above and beyond and really got innovative about how to do things. And that, it's that employee engagement and empowerment that was led by, again, our, our leadership team. That is what, is what has changed the trajectory of Oxy. We are a much more technically focused company today than we've ever been. In the past, we were much more of an M&A company. Now, now we have the assets. We, we have the best assets that we've had in the history of our company, and we're focusing on making sure that every dollar we spend delivers the most value, and that's by completely going above and beyond on our technical evaluations and including data analytics. And the data analytics team that we built was before, you know, that became the big thing in the oil and gas industry to do. So about half this room are kind of energy wonks and half not so much. Um, your company made a really big move that has turned out to be quite brilliant, which is you moved into the, the Permian Basin um, just as a lot of people were you know, getting bored and leaving the field. Um, it was right around um, when the opportunity to use horizontal drilling and hydrofracking became, I think, a much more prominent opportunity. Um, was that just dumb luck. I mean, how did, how did you as a company understand that was the place to go where other very large, very smart, technically capable companies were walking in the other direction? Well, our former CEO, uh, Steve Chazen, he, he was a geologist but also a financial guru, but he, in addition, had an intuition about the industry and he knew that where there was stacked pay, that there was always a chance to be more successful than you thought you could be. And so when, when the majors were exiting the Permian Basin, we bought their properties. That gave us a, a foothold in the basin. Um, and we've stayed there since then and been able to expand from the conventional assets that we bought back in 2000 now to the unconventional as we've developed um, beyond that. So we have 34 CO2 floods in the Permian Basin. We're the only company with with a large position in the conventional oil and gas and using enhanced oil recovery and also a large position in the shale play. So that, that's going to, we think, in the future provide more advantages for us versus others with respect to the, some of the other things we want to accomplish. Okay, so I want to turn towards the question of you know, <coughs> development, national security, climate change. Um, you used a couple of phrases um, which might not be obvious to everybody. Um, EOR, carbon capture, use and storage. Um, Oxy has really been the industry leader in thinking about this idea of capturing carbon from 
power and industrial facilities, piping it and using it to produce more oil. Just give us five or six minutes. What's that about? Why are you doing it? Um, is it just a cute gimmick? Is it a real you know, part of your business future? Mm -hmm. um, well, CO2 enhanced oil recovery is where you inject CO2 into an oil reservoir. And the, the reason you do that is with primary production from a conventional reservoir, you can usually produce about 15% of the oil in place or hydrocarbons in place. With water flooding, which we do after that, uh, we can push oil uh, from a, an injector to a producer put, putting water in the reservoir. But because the, the reservoir is not this big cavern that you might imagine, uh, it, it almost looks like if you have marble on, on your countertops, the formation looks like that. It has very small porosity, and porosity is in the 15 to 20 percent range, so sometimes you can't even see it when you, when you take a core of part of the reservoir. But that reservoir, uh, there's, there's micropores where oil gets trapped and the water can't displace it. So the micropores are the reason that you want to inject CO2 because the CO2 becomes miscible in the oil, so it expands that oil molecule that's, that's trapped in that micropore and makes it less viscous and therefore moves it out of that micropore space and replaces that oil molecule with CO2. So the CO2 remains in the reservoir, a portion of it, and then the oil can move to the producer. So we've been doing CO2 enhanced oil recovery for decades. Now what we see as an opportunity for Oxy is to take the lead on capturing carbon from industries to, in, to inject into our oil reservoirs to sequester it. Because as you're injecting CO2, those micro pore spaces take about 40% of the CO2 that you're injecting as you inject it. So if you cycle it around, ultimately you can sequester all of what you're injecting into the reservoir. And so we, we've been sequestering for a while now through uh, from our Terrell plant and then from another plant that, uh, that we bought from a, or built from a third party. So we've been sequestering for a while. We're the first company that got the, an MRV plan from EPA to sequester and receive tax credits for the sequestration. So now we're putting together a strategy to pick up industrial CO2 from, um, from sources, ethanol plants and other types of plants in the mid-continent area. To, for use in our uh, CO2, in our EOR reservoirs. So CCUS means carbon capture, use, and sequestration. So when you hear that, that means using it in a conventional reservoir. Uh, when you hear CCS, that's carbon capture and sequestration. That means not using it for enhanced oil recovery, but sequestering it in, say, like a brine reservoir. So the reason that that use is so important is that that whatever world demand is for oil, you know, we, we know that, that a transition has to occur to move away from more, to lessen our dependence on oil around the world. But oil is going to be needed for decades to come. So since it's going to be needed for decades to come, we feel the best way to ensure that we can continue to produce the oil that the world needs, but with lower emissions, is to use CO2 for that production. because. When you inject CO2, as I just told you, you've got to inject a certain amount of CO2 to produce a barrel of oil. So what that means is when that barrel of oil is used and, and, the, CO, and the CO2 is emitted from the use of that barrel of oil, the net usage for that oil produced is it emits only 25% of the emissions of a barrel that's produced from a reservoir where CO2 is not used to produce it. So the best way to move toward a lower emission oil production is to use CO2 to move the oil out of the reservoir into the surface. And that's what we're doing. We're, we have a strategy to do it. We've formed a low carbon ventures team to work on advancing that strategy at a faster pace, but also to look for other technologies that will enable us to, in some cases, use CO2 products for our CO2 for making products, and then also for uh, investing in technologies that just avoid emissions. We just we recently invested in net power, which is a, a process that generates power at a lower cost than a typical power plant and uses CO2 in the process to produce that, that power 
because it's separated out. So then it helps to generate the power, and then it comes off as a full CO2 stream with no other emissions, and that stream can be used then for, it can either be sequestered or used in an oil reservoir. So it's a new technology. It just recently got the Best Technology Award at ATAPEC, which is the um, Abu Dhabi International Petroleum uh, Conference. And so uh, it's the largest oil and gas conference now in the world, and it got the best technology. We were um, invested in that, and we'll be using that in a lot of our operations around the world. So you may have noticed that the climate debate's been a little bit polarized over the last decade. <laughs> and you know, one of our imaginations um, here at the Bipartisan Policy Center is that if we would broaden the solution set, to be kind of technologically inclusive around you know, zero and ultra low carbon, that that would move us past the fight about whether there's a challenge or not and kind of towards a constructive fight over what the solution should look like. Evidence of that um, came last year when a very interesting coalition of coal companies, environmental organizations, <laughs> oil companies came together around uh, tax provision which has now been lauded as the letters 45Q. Um, talk about that a little bit. Occidental was really, I think, critical there. And what, it, what does that say to you? Or does that suggest to you that there actually is a lane there that could grow a more constructive climate debate? Oh, without a doubt. I was telling, I think, Colin or Glenn earlier that um, that, that process, that we have a team that's um, led by Al Collins and, and Ian Davis and, and Charlene Russell, another person in, within our company. That team worked for six years on 45Q. But what really helped to move the, the, the dial on that was when we formed this, we became a part of a coalition. And being part of that coalition was very helpful to, to get 45Q finally passed. And Senator Heidkamp had, you know, led the effort too um, on her side. And so it, without that coalition, I don't think we would have ever gotten 45Q passed. But also the other thing about that coalition, the collaboration within that coalition was really focused on driving us toward the right solution. But being a part of it also helped to frame our thoughts around some things and open our eyes and help us become um, more conscious of things that, that could help us to become a leader in this, in this part of the industry. And uh, the coalition did a lot more than pass 45Q. It's, it's helped, I think, become a model for how we need to do things in the future. And we need to be collaborative with all the parties and all the stakeholders involved. Say a little bit about what 45Q did to actually make the business model work. And are we good? Do we need more constructive federal and state policy to really turn this idea into a you know, national exercise? Well, 45Q, it provided the tax credits for the capture of CO2. Without that, industry would not be able to afford it. Um, as all of you know, solar and wind has had uh, financial incentives for a long period of time. And when you hear people saying that carbon capture can't work because the technology is not there, it's too expensive, uh, wind and solar with the incentives that were applied to those industries actually reduced um, their, the cost of that equipment by 66 and 75 percent respectively. So there was significant cost reductions with the incentives that were provided to them over one over six year period and the other over a nine year period. Uh, we believe that we can advance the technology faster than that, but it does need some incentive. 45Q was just a part of what we need. Um, the, the Use It Act is another thing that could potentially help us um, because it will help with the infrastructure. Uh, the other part of that is, um, is ultimately, um, there's been a lot of talk about some price or tax on carbon. Um, I believe that should something like that occur, that as long as we can use the funds for the advancement of the technology, then we will be able to make this happen on a larger scale at a faster pace than, than we would be able to do otherwise. So I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to you all, and I have like 17 more if you're shy. <laughs> um, so broadly, the posture of the oil industry and the climate debate has been you know, controversial, ever-changing. Everyone has a different view of where the companies are or should be. Um, Oxy joined um, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, kind of an international 
effort that um, certainly is bringing a very proactive voice to trying to find a climate solution. Why would you do it? Hard decision. You know, where do you see the voice of the oil industry writ large just beyond Oxy kind of going forward? Uh, it was an easy decision for us um, and where we started lobbying for it was when um, I was one of only two U.S. CEOs invited to the Vatican when the Pope wanted to have the summit on how to transition beyond oil. And that was a summit of not only uh, CEOs, mostly European, and again, only two of us from the United States, um, but the summit, the summit also included investors, the investment community, renewables, academia, Columbia Uni University was there, uh, Notre Dame was there, but also um, investment people in um, environmental groups. So it was a great coalition. It was another one of those opportunities to, to hear in a closed environment everybody's view. And um, what came out of that is carbon capture is critical. That, that's the only way we'll, we'll achieve the, the uh, Paris Accord. That's the only way we can really cap emissions to one and a half to two degrees Celsius. Without carbon capture, it cannot happen. That was the consensus of the group. And um, I think that we lobbied at that, um, at that event with Bob Dudley, the chairman of OGCI, who, who then talked to the rest of the members of, who were mostly the European companies and a few outside, Saudi Aramco and a couple of others, uh, but no U.S. companies at the time. And he saw our commitment. He saw the way we feel about this and that we were trying to progress beyond where we are today. And, and so he invited, uh, the OGCI invited us and two more U.S. companies, Exxon and Chevron, to join. We all three did. And we wanted to be a part of an effort where the, the requirements of being a member of that is that you set stringent goals around emission reduction. And what, what we, we like to be, as being a part of that is that we have to achieve those. We've set the, the goals. We have to achieve it. If you don't achieve it, you can't stay a member. And we believe that that pressure um, is going to help our industry to, to learn more and be more collaborative around the ways to make that happen. So sharing best practices and helping each other, uh, we believe that that organization is going, to, is going to lead the effort in the oil and gas industry. So I want to open it up for questions. And do we have our uh, folks with mics? We have right over here. Just uh, let us know uh, who you are. Hi, I'm Blair Beasley with the BPC Energy Project. Um, I really appreciate you being here. And you've spoken a lot about um, industry's role in kind of taking a leadership um, to try to address climate. Is, do you feel like there's a role for regulatory action in this space as well? And if so, what would you like to see happen? Well, I think part of the regulatory action has already occurred with EPA um, putting together the MRV requirements uh, for the tax credits. Um, I think e EPA was very thoughtful about what they put in place there. It's, it's not too stringent, but it's, it's stringent enough to make sure that you have to, you have, to have the right um, equipment in place to know what's happening with your, with your sequestration, your volumes, um, and how, how that process is going. So it's, it's, a, it's not an, an easy requirement, but it's a doable requirement. So I think. Uh, the regulatory world needs to be involved in this process as we move forward. And I think more collaboration with EPA on other things also is, is going to lead us to the right solutions for what we need to accomplish. Right up front. Uh. Thanks. Thanks for being here, Vicki. Um, you're sitting in Tom, front of a Tom, uh, Dower. Tom Dower from ArcelorMittal, steel and mining company, um, uh, and also you know, a DC dweller. So uh, the question is really about that. How do you talk about carbon outside of Washington? Um, we, what we have to do is it, it's a difficult thing to talk about in some arenas. Um, but we have been, we have gone around the world. Our team has gone around the world. And we, are, we have put ourselves out there. Um, to have this commitment. We are committed. We're, we have put together the team. We've set aside the capital. And so we are sharing our strategy with everyone because we think others can, can ultimately, can and should get on board and start to, to do the same things. 
Um, what we have to be careful about is how we talk about climate change. And uh, while we're a believer in it, um, the United States is a, is a litigious environment. And so we want to we wanna be out there to, um, and we want to admit, we believe climate change is real. And we're doing the things we need to do to address it. And we feel like it's um, something we need to do for sustainability. Uh, the, in addition to ensuring you have reserves to develop over decades to come, and, if, and in addition to making sure that you engage and empower your employees and invest in human capital, the other thing you have to do is you have to have a sustainable business. And the sustainable part of that business needs to me means that you have to, over time, lower your environmental footprint in all ways, not, not just with respect to emissions, but other things as well. And we've got to be more aggressive with that. And so we're starting to talk about it more um, and being open about what we're doing. That's, that's, that's it. Other, I think there's uh, a question over here. Oh, Mike. Mm -hmm. Vicki, thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm Mike Telser with General Atomics Company in San Diego. I'm wondering, you know, the United States, I've been here a long time following the oil uh, uh, energy issues, and we've gone through um, most, in large part because of the technological development that you've seized on of shale and, and recovery from going from an importing country. I just read last week that we actually were a net exporter finally. Uh, how do you see that changing uh, the industry and the kinds of things that we do? For example, will we be becoming a big exporter of gas? What will that be the effect on gas prices? How do you expect you know, demand and supply things that we took for granted over the last 40 years? over the next 20, 30 years. It won't be forever, but you know, it'll be for quite a while. We'll have to change the ways we think to deal with the new conventional, the old conventional wisdom that I think is dead. Okay. That, please talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the dynamics of uh, the energy industry in the United States is impacting the world. I give our former CEO another uh, bit of credit as that he had the foresight to buy the U.S. Naval Station in Ingleside and convert it into an export oil export terminal, which we did. We've now sold it. We monetized it so that we could uh, and invest in some higher return projects for our shareholders. But that, that export terminal was really important because we are outrunning the capacity of the refineries in the United States. That's why we're exporting more now. Than, than we're importing. Uh, so that's happened on the oil side. It's going to continue to be an issue. Um, also, the type of uh, the quality of the oil that's being produced from the shale is different than some of our refineries are prepared to run. So I think that we're going to continue to, over the next few years, grow our production in the United States. So we'll continue to uh, be a net exporter over, the, I think, for the next three to five years at least. Um, there's, and there's a lot of gas in the United States. Um, not just what's been developed today, there's still a lot of gas in the Rocky Mountains. So I, we were talking earlier, gas is going to be something that now becomes a big export for us too. We're not going to have enough LNG capacity over the next few years to handle the gas production that we have. So more LNG is going to have to be <laughs> built. Um, Mexico, there's a pipeline to Mexico, but Mexico is not prepared to take all of that. They don't have the infrastructure yet. Ultimately, that could be another uh, export um, uh, area for the United States and will be when, when they get their infrastructure prepared. But we, uh, for the next at least um, three to five years, I believe, we're, we're going to be in export mode on oil. And I believe even longer than that, in export mode on gas. So it's, we're, we're impacting the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question right up front and then a few rows back. Hi, uh, Esther Wielden with Global Market Intelligence, S&P Global Market Intelligence. Um, two questions, different topics. Um, one, so just to be clear, I was just looking at the oil and gas initiative, and I don't see anything in there about a price on carbon specifically. Have you guys taken an official position on that? Are you lobbying on that? I know that's been a criticism of the industry, not really saying things to Congress to promote that if they want it at all. Um, the other thing is on the gender diversity issue, um, obviously you've had some support getting to where you're at. What are you doing to help support women to get to the same position? 
I would say on the first question, um, the oil and gas climate initiative has not come out with any um, position on that yet, but but please don't think that they aren't doing a lot behind the scenes to just make things happen. Like for the UK, um, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative is supporting a major carbon capture project in the UK. We're the only US company. As a part of OGI, OGCI, you can, you can select the projects you're willing to put your capital toward, but you have a capital commitment that you have to achieve over a certain period of time. We're the only US company that invested in the UK a carbon capture project because it's led by BP because we want to advance the technology. And so there's a lot happening. OGCI is going to drive a lot. And with respect to coming out with a position on, on carbon pricing, I think everybody's trying to figure out what that needs to be. And I do believe that the best way to get to the right solution is not OGCI determining it, not API doing it alone, but this coalition, getting back to the coalition of more than just a, the oil and gas companies, of uh, the stakeholders across all the segments getting together, together to make that recommendation. Uh, with respect to gender, what am I doing? Um, I'm a part of uh, Khalifa University. Um, I'm on their board of directors, and, and that's serving in that role, <coughs> trying to help advance women in, um, in Abu Dhabi, the Emirati women. They're incredible ladies. I meet, I've uh, met for the last couple of years to have dinner with them and follow-ups and networking to, to just discuss issues with them. And um, what I found at the last dinner with them is I'm not sure I need to be having this dinner with them anymore. They're, they're incredibly bright and they're starting their own networking and they're doing it uh, not with just females but with, with males. They, they like to get the men in the room too and talk about how to advance opportunities for women in Abu Dhabi and that's happening. Um, also, we've just started an organization in, um, in Houston that will be more visible here pretty soon where we are um, donating our, our time and um, getting others to come and speak for a women's organization that's going to be more focused on really addressing the issues they have. So not so much getting speakers to come in, but doing selecting some women where we are going to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring and also provide opportunities that they can come in an environment that's safer to address the specific issues that they're having within their career to try to help them have a sounding board and, uh, and so more women to brainstorm with to overcome some of the issues. You know, you read a lot of the leadership books, but then you, you always have a, a situation that's unique that you can't find in a book. So the best way we believe to resolve that is is one on one in an environment where it's confidential to them and, and we can provide some real life experiences. Time for a few more questions. I think right. To... Hi, Julia Bussey with Chevron. Um, my question really is around CCS and what we see internationally as well as in the U.S. And what are the things and, and projects that you think have real merit? And are there um, opportunities for changes internationally so that uh, more CCS is adopted? I, I think so. We, we supported uh, ADNOC technically um, when, when they were looking at installing the carbon capture on the steel plant in Abu Dhabi and using the CO2 in some of their onshore reservoirs. They, that project is up and running, is, is successful. We supported them on the side of once you get the CO2, how do you make it work in the reservoir? But they've made that work. I, I believe in, in Qatar, there's discussion there about doing it at one of the, the largest onshore fields they have there. I, I believe that the, the European companies have been pretty progressive around some of the things they've done, but this UK carbon capture project will be the largest and first uh, in the UK of its kind. Um, that's why we, we wanted to support that. But I do believe that I see in, the, um, in the, the countries that we operate in the Middle East, I see the, the paradigm changing and I see them becoming much more progressive toward ensuring that future projects address the issue of carbon emissions. And so I believe it's, at least in the areas that we operate, that it's going to be, I think it's going to be a bigger part of their future planning. The, the good thing about some of the um, Middle East countries is they, they actually put together plans. They have a, 
you know, they have a 2030 plan or a 2025 or 2040 plan. They put together plans for the development of their country as a whole. And as a part of that, they deal with the energy aspect of it and they deal with the environmental part of it. Oman's about to put together another program like that. And so I, th I think where you have countries that, that actually plan out what their future will be and can incorporate carbon capture and, and carbon, or at least lowering carbon emissions, I think that's where you have the opportunity to see things happening. I don't know, I'm not as familiar with what's happening in the Asian area, but, but I'm seeing really positive things otherwise. Sir, this might be the last question. Hi, Tom Ruscha, uh, interested but uh, unaffiliated individual. Uh, so my question would be, you talk about the sustainability, uh, I think uh, about economic sustainability. What is the role of the independent uh, oil and gas producer out in the Midwest? Uh, as we talk about you know, large balance sheets of, of companies like yours, how, what's their role, what's their view, and uh, how do you think they play into this? Uh, so I'd say we have a very strong balance sheet, but not incredibly large. That's why we have to be very thoughtful about how we do this. Uh, but we're doing it. You know, we're, we're depending on the day, we, we range from a 53 to $60 billion company, and that, that range can change a lot, almost that extreme in, in a week. But, but we're invested in it. I think everybody plays a role. What API has done that, that a lot of the smaller companies are participating in is um, sharing best practices around not so much carbon capture and sequestration or utilization. That's where we think we play a role ultimately in the Permian where we can expand what we're doing to the smaller operators who surround us. We believe that we can over time make it very large in the Permian, both in the conventional and unconventional. So with respect to carbon capture, use and sequestration, we believe we can play a part helping the smaller companies. But, but the other organization that's playing a part is API to help um, install best practices and share best practices around how do you just reduce methane emissions? What is the best way to do that? And um, so we're, we've had a voluntary program as a part of API that, that we've had many people, many companies join now. I don't know, Eric was telling me earlier from API that it, we were up to 55 companies now of companies that are really trying to reduce emissions and have voluntarily committed to do certain things to make that happen. So again, paradigms are changing. The oil industry has been slow to change, but now that we're gaining some momentum, the, the uh, rate, the pace of change is starting to increase. So I have a, a final question to kind of go to the broad economy. The economy's working real well for me and a lot of people, and a lot of others are on the edge. I think the Treasury did a survey, which is quoted too much, that 40% of Americans believe they could not acquire $400 without having to sell a you know, possession or go to a payday lender. Talking about the kind of shareholder pressures, you're a long-term business. You clearly have a great investment in your people and human capital. What role do, are you playing? What role do you think corporations should be playing in that basic question about just the f functioning of capitalism, and whether it's going to be sustainable? Well, that's a big uh, question. interesting We're question. Looking, <laughs> looking, at, well, no, uh, looking at the Quite yellow vest. Yeah. Um, well, I think that uh, that's part of what entered our head when we didn't cut our dividend. Because the other part of coming up through the company is that I, I get emails from those guys who were on the drilling rigs with me, who were out in the field with me, who were training me back then, who are now retired saying, Vicki, please do not cut the dividend. I'm putting my grandkid through school. I need this dividend. And I get letters from our shareholders, some, some of which I have never worked with, just people out of the blue saying, first of all, giving me advice about what I should and shouldn't do, but then telling me they need this dividend. And so while our directors are, are charged with thinking about the bigger investor, I am dealing with our smaller investors and I care about them. I care about the guys that helped me get to where I am today. And when, when you think about cutting the dividend and you're thinking about a large institutional investor, you sometimes could think oh, they can deal with it. But the funds that they're getting sometimes are from people who really depend on it. And, and that's part of what drove us not to cut it. We, there are people that depend on it and that expected it to be there. And if you cut it, yeah, it would have, it would have probably 
made it a lot easier on our leadership team to cut it because others did and they survived it. But um, but we felt like it's an obligation and um, and we were we just weren't gonna gonna neglect our obligation and and so I I think that with respect to the broader economy though. Um, I think that also the other thing we're doing is when, when prices have just recently dropped. Um, you know, recently we had, we were thinking we're, we were going to keep um, uh, WTI above 60 bucks, and it drops down to, to 50. The first thing some companies will do is drop rigs. And this is right before Christmas. Companies are just dropping rigs. And what does it do to those guys that work on the rigs? And, um, the women, men and women that are impacted by decisions that you can make. So we thought about it, we started to do it, and then we said we're not gonna drop rigs. We're gonna, we're gonna keep our rigs running and we're gonna figure out how to reduce cost in some other way that's not impacting people who are depending on that job for their sustenance and for their family. Especially not do it at this time of the year. And so we think about those things I don't know what I can do to help the broader economy other than that. Well, I mean, something else that you I are, don't have the spare time to Something else you are doing, though, is you're a, you're a technology company with a long-term yes. vision. Do you find pressure ever from your shareholders who care about what's happening the next day, the week, or month versus your you know, 10, 20, 30-year kind of technology? I, I tell you what, what we see in, in, the, um, in the investment community now is so many companies being rewarded for short-term decisions that negatively impact the long-term viability and health of the company. We have avoided being so pressured into the short-term investors, and we actually recently, our CFO called our four largest investors to ask, are we doing what you want us to do? You know, how does it, how do you feel about dividend growth? How do you feel about where we're putting our capital right now? And, and how do you feel about, um, about our sustainability programs? And we got positive feedback. But what's more than the positive feedback to the CFO is that three of our, our top four investors in the third quarter bought more of us. What that tells us is that we're doing the right thing. But our stock price gets, in, gets impacted almost every week by changes in oil prices. And so we're being, we're being damaged by the short-term investors. Uh, the, the investors that are just playing the market. And uh, there's so many of them now. There's such a high percentage of our, of everybody's in, in investment that it's, it's, it's impactful. Our, our, our uh, share price can swing a lot in a given day sometimes in a, in a, or in a week. And so it's, um, we do feel the pressure to, to react to that because um, some, some of those short-termers, they, they want us to do nothing but spend every dollar of cash that we have to buy back shares. And when, when, as I said earlier, when you have the best investment portfolio of assets that you've ever had in the history of your company, we're not going to spend every dollar that we have to buy back shares. We're going to invest in, in our business and, and invest for the long-term growth and health of our business. So I think... Um you all understand why we wanted Vicki to be part of this series. You have been a leader your whole life. And I think your ability to lead just as a person, as a policy maker, and as a business leader is really what um, we were hoping to learn a little bit about. And I certainly have come away with some ideas that I think are resonant not just with your life, but with uh, all the rest of ours. So I thank you for the time. Well, thank you.